Hey, what's happening audio channel enthusiasts? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech, getting down with LG's 2022 $1,500 9.1.5 flagship soundbar system. My last LG bar review was the 2020 SN11RG, which I think is fair to say, very similar to the 2021 SP11RA, the most notable upgrade probably being AirPlay support. Anyway, I skipped the RA, it seemed too similar. Now the 2022 S95QR in contrast has departed noticeably from the 11RGA era and my LG curiosity was awakened. And I'm assuming yours too, so let's get to it. Setup. In Soundbar Utopia, which I'm still looking for, this is supposed to be a download the LG Soundbar app, get the bar connected to the network, blah, blah, straightforward, three to four minute process. My experience was significantly more rocky than that, plagued with disconnects from the surrounds and the sub, along with bar silence. I had to reset the bar a few times to steady the ship, and to be fair, eventually everything started to work as intended. For the few days I've been testing, it's been smooth sailing. With the exception that the app regularly disconnects from the bar and it can be difficult and or time consuming to reestablish a connection. So a speed bump if you have something like zero tolerance for troubleshooting your home audio equipment, it's a terrible way to spend your life, I can speak from experience. Build. Design and build. The design is, well, not gonna be what makes this bar feel special. All the components are some shade of gray, giving me the sense that everything was styled to meet a specific purpose. So, mostly function, very, very light on the form. The bar is 47.2 inches wide, which most closely matches a 50 inch TV. For better or worse, this bar is nearly 10 inches narrower than the previous generation. But keep in mind, those bars were freakishly wide. This bar is very much in the mainstream, less than an inch shorter than the Samsung Q990B, and two inches longer than the Sonos Arc. Nonetheless, we're dealing with the potential diminution of the soundstage relative to the predecessors. But on the other hand, this bar is less likely to make your TV feel inadequate. The bar is encased in an understated faux brushed metal plastic, and there is a cloth grill spanning the sides and front. The fabric is fine and does not seem to be a super electromagnet for fuzzies. Though I know for some of you, fabric on the bar is a no-no. No, 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 no. no. If there is anything like a design element on this bar, it's the flared out sides that assist in bouncing sound off walls. On top of the bar, you'll find three circle grills that support the three upward firing channels. We'll get to that. In the back, you'll find pretty much nothing. Uh, connections and mounting holes are all on the bottom-ish. Um, a mount is included in the purchase. I gotta say, I'm a little underwhelmed by this bar's heft. In general, it seemed to be made of less or lighter weight material then used in other flagships, so 65% of the weight of the Q990B, while being something close to the same volume. The surrounds material are consistent with the bar, same casing and cloth grill. The surrounds are voluminous, the biggest I've seen in a soundbar kit. It really is approaching bookshelf speaker size, and unlike the bar, they're dense and weighty. The surrounds have a unique shape. It's technically, I think, in a regular pentagon, but best described as a home button if put on its side. In the back, you'll find a pairing button. and the bottom, you'll find the mounting holes and power ports. No screw hole in the back, so that could be a minor inconvenience for you when mounting. The sub uses the same gray color scheme and is extremely standard with a side firing rather than a downward firing woofer. This is not the prettiest system nor most impressively built, but to the extent that this kind of thing matters, it's all within the acceptable range. Channels, as mentioned, this is a 9.1.5 channel system, so 15 discrete channels. That's a lot of soldiers to go to war with. Encouraging. For those unfamiliar with the channel number scheme, the first number, in this case, nine, means there are nine separate channels all dedicated to going horizontal, often referred to as ear level channels, though hopefully all channels are ear level channels to some degree. Next, the dot one in the middle refers to the low frequency channel managed by this thing. <laughs> and the third number, a five in this instance, is in reference to the number of upward firing channels shooting up and bouncing off the ceiling. These upward firing speakers do their best to mimic ceiling mounted speakers. Hard to match the real deal, but a participation trophy is certainly deserved. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper, going back to the nine. Three of the nine ear level channels are in the front of the bar 
with a left, center, and right channel. These are direct channels meant to be shot directly at your face. The front, left, and right surround channels on the bar are angled and intended to deliver sound via your sidewalls, making it sound as though real speakers are placed somewhere between your front and side. So that accounts for the five ear level channels on the bar. The remaining four are on the surrounds. These surrounds do vary from the norm in that they both have two, not one, ear level channels. One of these channels on each of the rear speakers are meant to be aimed directly at you from the rear, so a traditional rear channel. And the other is meant to virtualize a more rear-oriented surround by again bouncing the sound off your walls. Okay, now to the five upward firing channels. The biggest differentiator of this soundbar system relative to, well, every other soundbar system is that there are three upward firing speakers on the bar itself, where up to this point, there have been either zero or two. So on paper, this bar has an advantage in presenting vertical audio effects relative to the field. The remaining two high channels are on the rear surround modules and are used to mimic ceiling mounted speakers behind you. So about the drivers, there are 17 of them. Every channel is made of a single driver except for the bar's left and right channel that are composed of a 52 by 99 millimeter woofer along with a 20 millimeter silk dome tweeter. The center channel and surround channels are all two inch woofers. It's very odd for the center channel of a flagship to not have a tweeter, a bit of a noggin scratcher. The upward firing drivers on the bar include two and a half inch woofers on the left and right height channels and a 20 millimeter silk dome tweeter in the very unique center height channel, suggesting it has a slightly different purpose than the two other height channels. Dialogue enhancement is probably a really good guess. The surrounds use a two and a half inch woofer on all the channels. The base driver is eight inches, which is an inch bigger than the SN11RG. Supported audio formats. Just gonna round up and say everything. LG takes this stuff seriously. Good on them. You got all the Dolby's, all the DTS's, and LPCM 5.1 support. But wait, newish buzzword incoming. You also get IMAX enhanced compatibility. The exact implications of this is quite frankly murky, but I'll do my best to explain what IMAX enhanced is and the benefits of compatible products. I think the best way to describe IMAX Enhanced is something like authentic theater IMAX audio, free from some of the dynamic range control adjustments or excessive down mixing that may otherwise be applied to better suit limitations of lesser audio setups, like your TV or more humble surround setups. So all that coupled with a more IMAX-y visual experience, which includes a less letterbox, taller visual aspect ratio, coupled with a specialized HDR and grain reduction that can be more apparent when the video image gets bigger. Exactly how much more you get from a completely IMAX enhanced compatible setup, again, is somewhat murky, but the idea is that you get more refinement in presentation, so the precise IMAX HDR and originally intended audio dynamic range, so better rumbles. I always try to be honest, but to be honest, I have found it very difficult to get clear info on this technology. If a commenter wants to correct me and it's credible, I will make revisions with attribution in the video's description. Playing IMAX enhanced content. Don't let the mouse fool you. While Disney Plus touts IME, what they are really saying is that they are offering the visual stuff, but not the audio. As IME audio is a layer built on DTSX, which is a lossless data rich format, I'm not sure how you're gonna get that via streaming. For the full IME experience, you're gonna have to stick with Blu-rays for now, as far as I can tell, or get your back in the theater seat. For music, LG touts Meridian technology, which is this bar solution for up mixing a stereo signal to fit this highly channeled system. Verbiage like optimized sound localization, bigger sweet spot, more immersive listening seems to be the talking points. Okay, I guess we'll see. Okay, high res audio. Yes, it's supported. How do we expect to get high res audio these days? Via a streaming service. Spotify Connect is supported, but does not offer high res. Tidal is also supported, but in practice, it's not clear what this means, as I saw no Tidal Connect option to the bar. I remain unconvinced there is a way to get MQA or high res level audio to the bar. Customer service is less than helpful. I'm happy to have my viewers correct me here. If you're gonna do high res, I like to call it getting lucky because it's sometimes very tricky to pull off, you're gonna get it done via a USB stick with an LDAC or WAV file. 
I'm sure doing it with a USB will be cool again. Just give it a few years. Ports, the important ones showed up with eARC and two HDMI inputs, which allows lossless audio formats like Dolby True HD, DTSX, DTS Master Audio, LPCM to be sent directly to the bar from an eARC TV. If you do not yet have an eARC TV, which is very likely if you haven't bought a TV in the last two years, the bar's HDMI inputs give you a path to get the lossless sound to the system, bypassing your embarrassing TV. There are nice technology supported associated with all these HDMI ports, as opposed to optical per se. You can pass HDR10 and Dolby Vision, and for the gamers, you get variable refresh rate and auto low latency mode, both hopefully making your gaming experience less susceptible to jitters and more responsive to your world-class finger movements. If you think HDMI inputs are new fandangled and just the latest trend, you do still have the optical option, exiled over there, that will disqualify you from many of the rich home theater formats you would hope to enjoy on a bar like this. I suggest not using optical unless you're doing a prank on your friend. Sound adjustments. There are eight sound modes or effects. Music, cinema, clear voice, sports, game, bass blast. Oops, I forgot AI Sound Pro. It adapts to what you're watching. I'm a bad person. I'll sample the different modes in the sound check. I'm guessing you want to know how to make all 9.1.5 channels make noise. If so, go with Cinema or the very subtly named Bass Blast. You can also have the surrounds play all the time by turning on surround mode. You will find a room tuning feature available via the app. You will also find quite a bit of channel controls, which doesn't hurt, in particular if you want to tweak the main vocal channels or perhaps the prominence of the rears. LG could have really gone above and beyond with finely grained EQ controls, but they left us with just bass and treble, which is pretty normal. You'll also find a night mode and a dynamic range reducer. Typically, these two modes are the same thing. They both compress the sound, making the soft sounds more audible, like quiet dialogue, but capping the loud stuff to keep you out of wife jail or real jail if you share a wall. Both of these modes neuter the bass. Overall, there seems to be a sufficient number of dials to get a sound profile and balance that works for you. Wireless connectivity, the sound off. AirPlay 2, check. Chromecast, check. And Bluetooth 5.0 with SBC and AAC support. Check, but uh, no high res over Bluetooth. I'd say you're in a pretty strong position with these three technologies in terms of getting whatever audio on the bar you want without wires. While there is not an integrated microphone in the bar, it is Alexa and Google Assistant enabled, meaning you can yell at your bar via a third-party device. Keep in mind, when the bar turns off, it actually turns off. It disconnects from your network. As such, when you're about to set the mood with your lady via AirPlay or whatever, you'll have to somehow keep the mood going while you try to find the remote and turn the bar back on. You better be really rich. Controls, the shiny remote. It went on a diet and oiled itself up since the SN11RG two years ago. Simple looking, nothing special, gets the job done, especially when the app doesn't. Other than the obvious volume controls, which you can control with your TV remote, you can easily toggle through your sound modes and with a bit more effort, adjust channel levels and EQ. You'll find a setting button that will allow you to adjust whether you want the bar to turn on or off with the TV, you want surround mode, night mode, and more. Um, the ellipsis will elucidate the audio format. So are you listening to Dolby Atmos, for example? The app more or less does all the same stuff, along with setup and room tuning, but in a more visual, less toggle your way through manner. The app is fine, I suppose. They seem to put a fair amount of hints about what the app can do in the first page. Other kinds of functions you don't see on the landing page can be found in settings. Controls located on the bar are capacitive, straightforward, volume, input, play pause, Bluetooth pairing, Wi-Fi mode. No track control, so I think more bars should do this. Sometimes you gotta be hasty moving those tracks along. Musicians sometimes have potty mouths and on rare occasion you might have polite company. The display, very normal, a scrolling dot matrix that beyond giving you volume level, let's say provides confirmation of setting menu items and selections if you feel like getting fancy with the remote. The display does provide audio format confirmations and it turns off a few moments after the last user interaction. It does its job, it stays in its place. It's even somewhat readable from across the room, which I hope is part of a new trend. 
The sound. We got something impressive here. If you're considering a soundbar system with 15 discrete channels, you may be most interested in 3D audio object-based Dolby Atmos performance. When first assessing a bar's Atmos performance, I asked myself, how independent is the sound from the noisemakers? Is this system virtualizing invisible speakers in the ceiling and walls in a convincing way? My answer is yes, uh, both lounging, and roaming around my listening room, um, I was easily fooled by that magic trick where the sound's origins seem displaced from wherever the real speakers are located. Does this mean that every moment is an audio miracle? No, uh, soundbar hardware, and quite frankly, the source material is not set up for that. Not all 3D audio is going to go the extremes of what the technology can do. Its first job is to be a good movie, not an Atmos demo disc. Um, generally, audio effects in action sequences were spatially distinct and crisp. The most arresting audio spatial effects included rain, gunshots, glass shattering, vehicle speeding, and from behind you. This bar also adeptly managed atmospherics during a dialogue scene, whether birds chirping, a creek trickling, or traffic. Um, all this helps to promote that fantasy that you are situated in a 3D world. Anyway, as far as soundbar kits go, the Atmos effect on this bar which is different than overall sound quality, just misses the top tier, but is a step up from the SN11RG, if that's the pressing question. I do tend to think the soundbar Atmos leaders include the Sony HDA7000 and Nakamichi, which is arguably something other than a soundbar kit. Moving on from Atmos, another first order question I ask myself when first listening to a bar is whether this product is going to be a chore to listen to, like an annoying toxic co-star, or am I gonna have fun getting to know it? Is there some depth buried in the sound that intrigues? I don't think this bar elicits the same kind of sound profile intrigue as the Samsung flagship bars, or maybe even really the ARC or Bose 900. But I never felt like the sound was distasteful, empty and shallow, and lending some credence to intuition, I approached the bar with a positive mood. If someone said this is the only tool you'll have to listen to home theater audio for the next few years, well, that would be bad for my channel, but I'd be at peace with that. This would be an acceptable marriage for me. So aspects of the sound I appreciated um, was that I did not find the sound severe, as with the 11RG, which had like this metallic jaggedness to it. This bar glides above lower tier bars that strain to pump out spatial effects with too few drivers. I sensed the core of the sound, so the mids were given some care, um, giving the sound substance but avoiding muddiness. The bar is flexible enough to be reverential to more classic sound, but capable of executing on that modern sound with emphasized highs and lows. For your music listening, you can adopt a more intimate traditional experience using just the left and right channel along with a sub. Make sure to turn off the surround sound setting or really lean into what these modern sound bars can do that a 2.1 setup can't. So atmosphere and immersion. The bass performance. It's nimble. It didn't seem to goofishly step over lines where it wasn't supposed to. It gives shape and contour to the low end. You can see its abs. Some of the agility does seem to come at the cost of a chest rupturing physical experience you might get from the Cinema 1200 sub, for example. The sub extends the low end to a satisfying degree and keeps up with the rest of the system. 
And for those that are particularly concerned with voice clarity, it's quite good, in part due to the dedicated center channel, and also in part due to the dedicated center upward firing speaker that also carried a lot of the dialogue. If you really need to bring out the dialogue even more, you do have the clear voice sound mode option, as well as the option to increase the levels of the center channels. If dialogue is your number one concern, I'd highly recommend this product. Wrap up, this bar really came across as a significant step up from the SN11RG, despite this site telling me it doesn't sound quite as good. I'm quite pleased with the revised sound profile and the three additional channels do seem to make a difference in voice clarity and the precision of the Atmos effect. If there is an Achilles heel to this bar, it's on the Wi-Fi connectivity side with the app. I think you'll find your wellspring of frustration there. In spite of this challenge, I think it's a compelling home theater product at a reasonable price relative to its peers. Consider buying the S95QR in your next purchase matrix. Okay, gonna wrap this up, catch you on the next one.